In Palestine, the Israeli regime continues its relentless aggressions against the Palestinian people. Authorities registered more than 9,000 killed so far, among them 3,900 children. In Brazil, President Luis Inácio da Silva approved a support plan against organized crime in the state of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And in Rwanda, the government announced visa-free travel to the country for African citizens in order to promote the free movement of people and trade. Hello, welcome from the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Adresso Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Israeli occupation committed 10 massacres against the Gaza Strip in the last hours, leaving 231 Palestinians killed. According to figures from the Ministry of Health, there are now 9,488 dead after 29 days of the Israeli siege. The Health Ministry also registered 3,900 children killed since October 7, while the number of wounded is more than 24,000. Authorities also reported that Israel deliberately attacked 105 health institutions and put 16 hospitals out of service. The Israeli occupation forces have not ceased their attacks against hospitals, shelters, schools, sacred places, among others, in spite of the constant calls for several countries to stop the violence against the Palestinian people. On Saturday, Israeli bombed yet another apartment building in New Sarai refugee camp in central Gaza. As a result, seven people from one single family were killed and five others wounded. This is the latest in a series of airstrikes following Israel's ground invasion and encirclement of Gaza City. The onslaught of the Israeli occupation force against Palestine continues with massive detentions in the occupied West Bank. At least 50 Palestinians were apprehended during Israeli raids on Palestinian homes in the Al Fawar refugee camp. According to authorities, more than 2,000 Palestinians remain under illegal arrest in the West Bank and Jerusalem since the escalation of Israel's siege on the Palestinian people during 29 consecutive days of bombardment and massacres. In Palestine, Israeli attacks on residential complexes and health care centers continue. Over the past 24 hours, Israel has reportedly intensified its attacks on hospitals, schools and residential buildings. Among the attacks perpetrated by Israel are those targeting the entrance of Al-Quds Hospital in central Gaza, which left some 21 dead. In addition, some 15 Palestinians were reported killed in the attacks on the gate of Al-Shifa Hospital, considered the largest hospital in Gaza. The Saudi attacks were also reported in the vicinity of the Indonesian Hospital and the Nasser Hospital. On Saudi, Israeli occupation forces launched new massive attacks against southern Lebanon. Israeli forces confirmed the military actions and added that they carried out air, tank and artillery strikes against Hezbollah infrastructure, missile depots and military installations. They also say that these airstrikes were in response to repeated rocket attacks against northern Israel by Hezbollah. The leader of the Lebanese resistance movement, Sayed Hassan Nasrallah, warned in his first speech after the start of the Gaza conflict that Israel will make one of the biggest mistakes in its history if it attacks Lebanon. On Saturday in Iran, demonstrations were held throughout the country in support of the Palestinian people, condemning the war crimes perpetrated by Israel. The mass rallies began in the capital Tehran at 9 a.m. local time and were replicated in over 1,200 cities in the country, marking the National Day Against World Arrogance. People expressed their unwavering support for the resilient, oppressed people of Gaza and for Palestinian resistance groups. As a symbol of protest against the genocide perpetrated by the Zionist regime, students in Tehran set the flags of Israel and the United States on fire. Also in Australia, dozens of people gathered in support of the Palestinian people. The largest rally was held at Sydney's Hyde Park, where some 10,000 people expressed their support for the Palestinians and denounced the Israeli bombardment of the Gaza Strip. Shame on Israel was one of the most repeated slogans during the rally. The demonstrators also waved Palestinian flags and chanted Free Palestine. Demonstrators also urged for a ceasefire and for humanitarian aid to be allowed into the besieged Gaza. And in New Zealand, activists prevented a ship carrying arms from Israel from sailing. 
On Saturday, dozens of supporters of the Palestinian cause gathered near a U.S. warship loaded with weapons bound for Israel. The ship had to be redocked in the port of Auckland due to the pressure from the demonstrators. The people of New Zealand joined many others worldwide in expressing their solidarity with the Palestinian people and condemning the genocide perpetrated by Israel. And demonstrations continue around the world in support of the Palestinian people. In, Bra in Brazil, 13 biggest city citizens took to the streets to protest against the genocide in Gaza. Demonstrators called for the immediate end of Israel's extermination war against the Palestinian people while condemning Israel's shelling of civilian structures and the murder of innocent children. Those protesting also called on the Brazilian government to take a stand and stop all relations with the Zionist regime. We are demanding that the Brazilian government interrupt all negotiations and contracts and all relationships it has with the Zionist Israeli government. There is no way a country like ours, which is totally democratic, to have relations with a country which is exterminating an entire population. It's unacceptable. In the midst of a challenging situation, the people of Palestine continue to demonstrate unwavering resilience and hope. Despite being displaced from their homes and being victims of ruthless attacks for nearly a month, they refuse to let their hopes and aspirations disappear. Her special collaborator, Mohamed El Saife, has testimonies from a displaced woman in Palestine. Let's see. When the bombing started here, it was a warning bombing. We went out, and half the way there, I remember the birds. I went back and looked for them. I was not afraid of the bombs. I looked for the birds and I came. They live with me. I sleep near them. They eat what I eat. I go out and look for food for them. Under the attacks, I look for food for them. Being in the hospital, I have the birds with me. I feed them in spite of everything. I don't abandon them. As you can see, we are here in the Palace of Sheikh Zayed. I moved from here to Nasser Hospital. I have been here for 21 days. It's been a devastating war. In this war, where your enemy bombs you. We gave many martyrs. It is an unworthy life. There is no water, no bread, no electricity. We have nothing. Life here is very hard, very difficult. But we always thank God. We are resistant. The whole world abandoned us. We are alone in this. Let's now take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you'll find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back from the South. The Brazilian government approved a support plan against organized crime in the states of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva signed a decree establishing the creation of an integrated operation to combat organized crime, specifically for the port of Rio de Janeiro, Port of Santos, Port of Itaguai, Galeo Airport, and Gururos Airport. Established, there will be an integrated monitoring committee for security actions coordinated by the Justice and Defense Authorities with the help of the Federal Police and the Real Civil Police to suppress militias and drug trafficking. The two portfolios are to present a plan to modernize the actions of the aeronautics and Navy with the aim of improving the operations at ports, airports and borders. In Venezuela, a recent survey by the pollster Data Viva revealed that more than 63% of the population in the nation would vote for the ruling party's candidate over the opposition independent candidates. The study carried out for the 2024 elections indicates that only 3% of those consulted participated in the opposition primaries, compared to 80% who did not participate. It also indicates that the United Socialist Party of Venezuela remains the country's leading political force above the opposition independent parties. Russia's air defense forces managed to shoot down four Ukrainian drones over the Kursk and Belgorod regions. The information was confirmed by the Russian Ministry of Defense in a statement in which it detailed that the attempt of the Ukrainian military to commit terrorist attacks with the aircraft-type drones against targets in, on the territory of Russia was foiled. The security agency stressed that the on-duty air defense systems destroyed all Ukrainian manned aerial vehicles over Belgorod and Kursk regions. 
The Russian provinces bordering Ukraine are regularly attacked with shells and drones, forcing the population to sh seek shelter elsewhere. In Russia, an expo showcasing the country's achievements opened on Saturday. The expo occupies a vast exposition ground in northern Moscow, built under Stalin and renowned for its collection of elaborate so-called Soviet Gothic-style pavilions. It will remain open through the month leading to the coming presidential elections next March, in which current President Vladimir Putin is expected to take part. Putin has led Russian alternative as either president or prime minister since 2000. If re-elected, this would extend his term until 2030. Thematically, the exposition focuses on Russia as a country of diverse ethnic groups and cultures unified by a sense of national purpose. If financing for adult athletes is already complicated for young athletes who are just starting out, it is even more difficult. Catalina, a 16-year-old long-distance runner who was left out of the Pan American Games in Chile because of her age, but is already preparing for the World Championships in her discipline, knows this well. The problem? She's almost $5,000 US dollars short. Let's see the following story. A few meters from the National Stadium, Stadium in Santiago, Chile, Santiago, Nacional, Guillermo Santiago is against Chile, time. Guillermo he is trying to find a medalist to interview for the next edition of the news program he works for, while answering some personal messages. He is a sports journalist with more than 30 years of experience, who is now experiencing first-hand the fact that athletes have no funding. He is organizing a raffle for his 16-year-old granddaughter, who is ranked seventh in the world in cross-country I believe that our sports, our kids need more support from every point of view, and I don't think they're getting it right now. As a family, we had to make a raffle, get gift cards with friends. There are many people who are helping us, but in the end, our money is not enough. Our means are not enough. Probably shows the photos of his little Catalin and offer raffle numbers. Obviously, it is urgent to finance the pre-season with a view to the 2024 World Cup. That it may not only be an achievement for our families, but also an achievement like so many athletes today who are in the national stadium representing Chile with a lot of effort and that I have been able to see. John Catalina started skating at the age of eight. It was a hobby that today she remembers with emotion. She never thought of becoming a professional when she was a little girl and dreamed of becoming a sport doctor. It started as a hobby. Then I started to get the hang of it. My second year in the sport went very well. I started to win races and I started to realize it was a whole world that there were people who won medals. And I said, I want this. In Chile, in Chile and probably in all of Latin America, being a high-performance athlete is a family challenge. This is no exception. That's why they are focused on the raffle. They need to raise about $5,000. We love and enjoy being able to accompany her in this process, a path that has not been without sacrifices in time, on structure, and above all, financially. However, we are willing to keep working, to keep fighting, so that she can fulfill her dreams. Catalina is part of the national team of athletes. She is on the National Sport Institute list of promising athletes of Chile and receives support that, if it did not exist, would have simply ended in in her career. However, it is not enough. Future promises have a present to finance. It is a dream. It is something that I say. I want to be there soon. I know that they have worked hard for that, and I know that I am doing it too, and I will achieve it in every international event to get a gold for Chile, and hopefully be in the next Pan American Games. With illusion, he follows the medals of his teammates who are in the Pan American Games. This time, Chile has left the bottom skating quarters only for the elderly. Catalina has no urgency. She is calmly preparing for the goal. She knows she will soon have hanging around her neck. Vladimir Cortés y Paola Dragnik, Telesur, Chile. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Tresor English, 
There you'll be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The government of Rwanda announced that it would allow visa-free travel to the country for African citizens in order to promote the free movement of people and trade. The president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, made the announcement during the 23rd summit of the World Travel and Tourism Council while highlighting the potential of Africa as a unified tourist destination for a continent that still depends on 60% of its tourists from outside Africa, according to United Nations data. Kagame specified that any African will be able to take a plane to Rwanda whenever he or she wishes and will not have to pay anything to enter Kigali. Once the measure is implemented, Rwanda will become the fourth African country to eliminate travel restrictions for Africans. In Brazil, at least three people died this Friday due to events caused by heavy rains in the state of Sao Paulo. The state civil defense reported the death of two people in the cities of Osasco and Santo André, and a third in Pracava, all victims of collapsed walls. The rains were accompanied by winds that reached speeds of more than 100 km per hour, causing the fall of 100 trees and 46 landslides. The regional government indicated that the fire department attended around 800 emergency calls reporting failures in the electric service in several localities of the area. Indian authorities are on alert due to the severe fog that remains in the country and that they qualify as worrisome. According to the Central Pollution Control Board, the pollution level reaches 440, being 50 the ideal healthy index. For this reason, an emergency meeting was held in which the local government proposed the implementation of a long-term plan, including the temporary suspension of construction. In this context, authorities urged the population to stay at home and if they have to move around to do it by public transport to reduce emissions. In Nepal, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake in the west of the country killed at least 157 people and injured more than 185. The earthquake hit at 11.47 p.m. local time on Friday night. Its epicenter was located in the Jajarkot district with a depth of 10 to 15 kilometers. Although the magnitude of the earthquake was not serious, the damage and death toll are high due to the poor quality of the construction in the area and because it occurred while people were sleeping. Search and rescue efforts continue for the moment by the fire department who are trying to find the whereabouts of more people. The most affected areas are the district of Rukum and Jajarkot and they are also the most difficult regions to access after the last earthquake in 2015. In this context, rescue planes carrying injured people arriving, arrived in Nepal Gunj after evacuation efforts. Authorities said the death toll was expected to rise and noted that communications with many locations were cut at the site. Troops were clearing roads and mountain paths blocked by landslides while helicopters ferried health workers and medicine to hospitals. In Uruguay, the number of people evacuated due to the flooding of the Uruguay River in the north and west of the country increased to more than 3,000. The national emergency system stated that the high water levels caused the preventive evacuation of the affected areas. In spite of the fact that the level of the river raised a slight decrease, the precipitations that have lashed the nation for a week affected seven departments. In this sense, the national emergency system foresees a new wave of floods that would reach its maximum between the 9th and 10th of November. However, the institution considers the situation to be stable. And we have come to the end of this news brief. Before saying goodbye, we want to thank our Caribbean audience, especially the audience of Trinidad and Tobago. We are pleased to share our newscast and contribute to provide an alternative news source of the latest world events. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tresorenglish.net. You can also join us on our social media on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.